And welcome back to episode three of the Carbon Chronicles with Latimer Aldor, fresh from his journeys across a somewhat serene France. Um, thanks, John. Serene, well, it's very nice. Um, I wouldn't call it serene. I have a thing, well, we were down in the south of France, and I have a thing called the Mistral, <clears throat> which, as you may know, is a strong northerly wind that blows for mm. quite a large part of the year. And uh, unfortunately, we were cycling into it for about three days while we were trying to go up some hills as well. So it was very hard work. However, very pleasant down there as ever. Uh, you might have caught, the downside is I've caught a bit of a cold, so you might hear that in my voice. It's not not permanent, I hope, and it'll be getting better. One thing I did notice while I was down there, though, as you know, I'm sensitive to these matters and look around. There was almost no reference in any public sphere that I was in to climate change or greenness or sustainability or anything. Not in the app, you know, public adverts in the UK are full of you can you can just see the you other know, eco this and eco that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Couldn't see any of those in the south of France. Yeah. Couldn't see anything about saving energy, couldn't see anything about green cars, sort of one or two EVs, but not very many. Um the only bit I did see was they were redeveloping Marseille Airport, which is much needed, and there was in the sort of public literature. A couple of paragraphs about sustainability and all that stuff, but okay, that's otherwise compared with the UK, it was a a climate free zone, if if you want to think of it like that. And did you notice much in the way of firewood drying in the fields? Uh, Or forests? Not especially. We it was it was during the thing we did notice it was the time of the the wine harvest, the grape harvest. So they're bringing in lots of lots of grapes, and we went around a couple of uh wineries to see what they're doing with them it's, it's all good good stuff but no it wasn't particularly uh dried out any more than i've been down there in previous years so. okay um have they built any more windmills uh there were some windmills around but not down there there's not many i think the main wind, windmills are more in the center of france where you might expect because that's the higher part yeah um, but overall no it was Pretty much a climate-free zone, really. Okay, well, let's crack on. What are you going to tell us about tonight? Right. Well, yeah, so I thought tonight I might talk about uh, a guy called Ed Miliband and, and what he's been up to. And uh, Ed Miliband is a minister, UK's Minister for Energy, or in fact, his official title is Minister for Energy Security and Net Zero, which are an interesting pairing because they're... yeah. Conflicting. <laughs> they seem contradictory. <laughs> exactly. They're kind of contradictory. You can have energy, you can have energy security with lots of energy, but net zero is basically says you want to minimize the amount of energy you have. Particularly nothing that you can dig up and store and wait and use when you choose to and have stockpiles of or anything like that. That's exactly the last thing you want, which says to me security. Security of food says you've got a big granary full of wheat. Yeah that you're going to grow and grow a seed every time you need it. But that's the contradiction of greenery for you. Um, Ed himself, I'm talking on the right side here, he was the architect of what became Net Zero. He was the minister 16 years ago in the previous Labour government. Oh, yeah. yeah. He passed the cloud, was the ar- architect of the Climate Change Act, which eventually, by a couple of amendments in Parliament, became effectively the net zero act that we're following now, which says, <laughs> excuse me, which says we'll get to net zero by 2050. Right, yeah. But since Ed took office a couple of months ago, it's pretty clear his personal objective before that, because 2050, he may well not be in office still by then, may well not be in office by 2030, but he's doing his best, is to decarbonise the electricity grid of the UK by 2030. So that's 20 years before. And less than five years away from now. And by decarbonise, we think he means take all the fossil fuel out of the UK electricity supply system. So has and he not has he not explicitly detailed what he means by decarbonise? Let's um, let's get to the next chart, and you'll see. Oh, okay, right. Um, but but it, uh, to, just for some context. The electricity supply system of the UK 
represents about one fifth of our total energy. So it does all the stuff that we come that comes down a wire and a plug, but clearly there's lots and there's four fifths of the stuff doesn't. So that's boats and ships and trains and planes yep. and cars and transport and heating our houses and all those things which are not electrified. So it's yeah. it's a chunk, but it's not the biggest chunk of our our um our energy system. And on the left, I put a little picture of Ed, which I think sums him up beautifully. And here he was at a public meeting. Prime position. Remember and click on the slide. Sitting next to Greek and Thumb. Remember. Oh, no, sorry. Sorry, right. Okay. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Carry on. Prime position, yeah. sitting next to Greta, right. Sitting next to Greta with a look of adoration in his eyes. He's got his best <laughs> suit on. He's combed his hair. He's looking... He's looking like a teenage boy in love with a pop star, a big round eyes and so forth. Stay so careful now, careful now. She was quite young at that point. <laughs> I'm being I'm going as far, <laughs> as far as I dare, but but the expression on his face kind of sums him up. He yeah. really is a zealot in this uh, in this climate energy type uh, space. And we we need to remember that when we when we're watching his antics. So Here's our friend Ed. He came to office with this great idea. I'll decarbonize the UK grid by 2030. And though he's had 16 years since he was last in office to think about it, it became apparent fairly soon that he hadn't a clue how to do it. He appointed, oh, he was very good. He appointed, he took, made a lot, a lot of publicity things. He appointed somebody as head of mission control for net zero. Uh, I mean, if you were, uh, you and I are probably both old enough to remember the Apollo missions. Uh, yeah. It's uh, uh, an arrogance of thing, particularly because the guy doing the mission control is not a, not an engineer like um, France was in, in mission yeah. control. In, in his, but he's just a career civil servant of very little practical or implementation skill of anything. He's probably just a paper shuttler. But that's the kind of idea is this is a huge, great, big project. It's mission control. It's uh, saving the world and grandiose schemes. Worthy almost of, of people in France, but even they aren't doing this stuff. Um, but when he came down to it, it became apparent he didn't know how to do it. He hadn't a clue how to do it. So first thing he did was to um, send a hospital pass to the people who run the electricity grid, which we call the national grid. And it basically said to he said to them, please write back to me with your plan on how you're going to do this. And they fairly quickly and wisely <laughs> sent it back saying, we don't know, you're the <laughs> boss, go find out, we'll do what you tell us, but it's not our job to tell you what it is, what your strategy is. This so is that, fair, yeah. <laughs> kind of, that kind of failed a bit. So the answer is he's got this idea, but he has no clue how to do it, and the clock to... 2030 is ticking away at one day at a time. So bear that in mind when you look at all the rest of the stuff. I just okay. want to make a little personal note. I know of a government project in the health service which has taken seven years <clears throat> of dedicated people not to get as far as applying for planning permission. And it's okay. not a very difficult project. Um, I think it's very unlikely that this net zero uh, net zero in the grid will happen within five years. I doubt, I'm almost doubting if they'll get to the point of having a draft plan for discussion within five years. Yeah. But let's assume for the moment that it could be done. And let's try and see what some of the obstacles are going to be. And at this point, I want to change, change tack a little bit. You'll hear the gears grinding a bit. Tell you about a particular website I use. And this is called Gridwatch. You can see there the I put the um website the URL for anybody to do it. It's a it's a way of looking at how the UK's electricity is being made now and has been made in the past. There are a number of these around. The National Grid itself does one. I like this one because the presentation that I use, that I see, suits what I want to see best. Sometimes other ones use circles and so forth and pie charts. But this yeah. one is, is good for looking at 
And most mornings I look at this website to see how wind power is doing. Because we know that wind power is going to be a very big part of this um, decarbonisation. Mr Miliband has already said he's going to try and quadruple the number of offshore wind farms, to double the number of onshore wind farms, to give them as much money as they need and huge great prices to get them generating wind in the North Sea and other parts of the coast. Well, that's fine and dandy, but the big problem with wind, and always has been the big problem with wind power, and is the reason why wind power is no longer used for commercial sailing and is not no longer used for pumping the dikes in the Netherlands and is nan, 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 is that wind is fickle. And mm -hmm. wind can do a great deal of, you know, could produce a great deal of energy, a great deal of power. Yeah. But there are also times, and as I used to be a bit of a sailor, I know this very well, when there's no wind at all or very little wind, and it's very, very useless. Yeah. So I have yeah. a quick look every morning to see how wind is doing. And yesterday morning, by pure chance, I – oh, let me, yeah, let me go on to this and we'll come back to the mm -hmm. other one. I looked at wind for the night of what would have been then Tuesday night, Wednesday morning. Okay. And uh, we can see here, this this tells you a percentage of the total of UK's energy, uh, electricity being made by wind power. Yeah. And we can see there at midnight on that evening, it was making 30% was coming out of wind. Okay. But you know, I can see that's a decent amount of power uh, to get out. Although at midnight, it doesn't power drop off uh, as the night goes on. It does a bit, but but not. It's not that it disappears entirely. The, you know, the difference is about twenty percent, perhaps, between okay mid and peak in the morning, twenty or thirty percent mid midnight and peak in the morning. So, yes, but not hugely. Right. <clears throat> By six o'clock in the morning, so only in six hours, that thirty percent had dropped to. Under ten percent. That's just a an illustration of the fickleness of wind. It does yeah. that. It has periods when there is no wind, and they can be quite long periods. Now, when we go back to think about electricity, we got a problem with making electricity to run grids and so forth. Mm -hmm. That is, we have to carry on doing it. It's like breathing or flying. You can't, you can't stop breathing for half an hour and say, oh, well, the next half hour I'll breathe twice as fast and everything will be well. Yeah? Because you'll yeah. be dead. Yeah. You can't say, oh, I'm going to stop flying my aeroplane for half an hour, but I'm going to fly it twice as, twice as well for the half hour afterwards. Same problem. Yeah. You'd have crashed. And people... People get hung up on how much wind power is produced over a year or a month or a day or even you know half a day. Making electricity is not like that. You have to do it. It is a continuous process. So you can't just look at big annual averages and say, isn't it wonderful because the average was 24%. The point being, it might have been 24%, but large chunks of that might have been 2% or 1%. And that's... Or that's zero. Good. Or zero. It hardly ever gets to zero, given the big nature of our the place where we put the windmills. But there are... You know, it approaches zero and can yeah. stay there for some time. Let me just check where we are. Yeah, I've made that point now. Yeah. So let's go and look. The other thing our website will tell us is, is exactly more detail, exactly how all of the electricity is being made. And again, this is a snapshot taken at the time where it was 8% of wind. Okay. And it sends it nicely in a bar chart. And we can see here, here's our wind. 8% was wind in the duck egg blue. <laughs> Down here towards the bottom, we have connectors. We Buy and sell electricity internationally. Mostly we buy it, but here's some the various connectors we have to France so, and the Netherlands and so. Yeah. So, so this is this is basically at six o'clock in the morning. Yeah. 
This was about six o'clock. In the yeah, so obviously that's why there's no solar because the sun's yet to arrive. <laughs> I, I was about to say that, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there was no solar, but we still need the electricity. We still got electric trains to run. We still got traffic light systems to run. We still got hospitals to run. Yeah. We we can't just make, well, perhaps that's the plan. Maybe we only do things when the sun's up. You know? Solar power is a great way of <laughs> lighting a reading lamp at midday. It sounds like we're going back to medieval times almost, if, if we pursued this you know, to its logical don't, conclusion. Don't jest, <clears throat> because that is that seems to be precisely where we're going. But the point I was going to make here from the big picture is at that time, the big contribution came from this orange bar, yeah, 56% yeah. of electricity. An orange bar is called, I talk to Andrew, I'll talk to Andrew one day and see if I can get him to change it to gas, but it's CCGT means gas powered. Yeah. Right? So at that point, 56% of our electricity came from gas. Okay. Bear that in mind. And we, it, gas is the is the thing that comes and fills in the gaps for everything else. It's it's you know the the, yeah. the taxi of last resort. When everything else has fallen down, you ring Jim, and Jim comes and picks you up always at the time. Well, gas is sort of Jim of that 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 case, if you want to think. So that's what we were seeing, and. I just want to remind you of this. This is called this is an inconvenient truth. And what it basically says is if the wind isn't blowing, doesn't matter how many windmills you've got. Yeah. yeah. A windmill not, not going round, if you put one next to it, you've got twice as many windmills. That's still not going round, is still zero, zero watts. There's no power coming out of it. So just doubling the number of windmills does not necessarily double the amount of power you get at the times when you need it, which is low wind. And I, su I suppose the same would apply to solar. No matter how much solar you put down, you're only going to get power when the sun's up. Exactly. You don't get much solar power at midnight. You know, the the, the um, marginal cost of solar power at, at, at midnight is infinite. Yeah. So this takes me back then to one of our earlier episodes when we were talking about storage. And, yeah. You know, that that obviously is a problem that Mr. Miliband hasn't factored in yet and uh, has yet to address. Or well, he's hoping it will go away in some, some sort of way. Okay. There, there's another great <laughs> thing. You, men you mentioned solar. Some folks say, well, what we'll do is we'll have a, a bloody great cable and pick up all the um, solar power from Morocco. Well, okay. But Morocco is roughly on the same uh, longitude as we are, so it gets night time just when we do. So wow. the, the amount of solar power you can get from Morocco at midnight UK time is zero again. So probably. Wouldn't, wouldn't there be, I mean, uh, if you're going to transfer electricity that far, and even if you are ramping the voltage up, would there not be significant losses and you know, transmission losses? Yep. And if you wanted to think about energy security, well, you know what yeah. happened to the, the uh, a pipeline between Germany yeah. and Russia. Something had terrible happened there. Well, mm -hmm. I don't think finding a big electric cable under the sea between Morocco and the UK would be hugely difficult for somebody with a submarine, um, yeah. nor to disable it. I mean, you just <laughs> effectively, you just need a, a very big pair of wire cutters and some very insulated gloves, I suspect. <laughs> <laughs> but you get the basic a few, possibly a few dead fish as well <laughs> be floating to the surface after that shot got to them <laughs> what were you doing there salmon fishing <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> now let's move on and, and go back to that chart we looked at before because I just want to talk yeah. about a couple of things let's assume for the moment that Mr. Miliband has his way, and we eliminate gas. So that orange bar disappears. Okay. Okay. That's 56% of our total UK electricity supply has just vaporized in a puff of smoke. So what are we going to do? Are we going to have power cuts? Or well, how much can we ramp nuclear up by? 
Well, nuclear is a bit difficult. You can't two two things. One, making new nuclear takes a long time. Yeah. 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 Like Hinkley C, I think it is, is is dragging its way through and is another 15 years away. But even ramping up an existing running nuclear is not very easy. <laughs> no, they're they're effectively a constant supply of heat, which boils a kettle and the kettle yeah. turns to turbines. Um Making that constant supply go up or down is a difficult job, and there are limits with what you can do. So it's certainly not very responsive to fill in the gap of wind power that effectively died by three quarters in six hours. Yeah. Whatever you've got has got to be quick to respond. Right? So let's cancel out. Let's count out at the moment. Yep. Biomass is just burning firewood. It's a, a, a fancy name for burning firewood in, a, in a, the Drax power station in Yorkshire. Okay. So uh, is, can that ramp up? Well, you might be able to ramp it up a bit, but it's also determined by how fast you can get the firewood, uh, which is not as simple as, well, I'll just nip down the local forest and chop down another tree a bit quicker. We have to get this stuff from... You guessed it, Georgia in the United States of America. And the limiting factor there would be how many ships you've got that you could possibly get over there, and it takes six days and so forth. So, yeah, you might ramp that up a bit, might make it 10%, not 8%, but you're not going to make it 56%. Right, okay. Wind, we've talked about solar. Yeah, that's great. But as you can see, if the, if the sun ain't up, doesn't matter how much so it's like wind power, doesn't matter how many solar panels you've got. If they're, if they're all making zero, it doesn't matter. We've eliminated coal and gas because of decarbonization problems. And OOC oh, coal and oil. Uh, coal and oil, beg your pardon. My, yeah. my apologies. So and that OOC, is the is the last coal power station down? Is it decommissioned now? Due to be decommissioned, I think, within 10 days. All right, okay. Whether that means demolished, like they did at one of the other one, the, the previous government, there was a disgraceful picture of some government minister taking great delight in blowing it up just in case it was ever useful again. It was sort of the, the beaching of the, the doctor beaching of the railways came to power supply and decided to be as much a vandal as perhaps Dr. Beaching was. So we can't really pick any of these. Mm -hmm. Technologies and say we could use those instead of the gas that we're going to eliminate. We've, we've looked at them, they don't work. There's a thing called pumped hydro. Pumped hydro, I think we may have talked about this. You pump pump water up a hill when you need it, right. come back again, you open the turbines and the water comes back down again and you make make some electricity. That's fine, but here we are, we can see it's one percent, and that's probably about the limit of what we've got in the UK at the moment. Could we be more build more pumped hydro? Sure. Could we build 50 times as much as we've got within five years? Not a chance in hell. Yeah. So that's not going to fill the gap. Hydro yeah. itself, same sort of considerations. And then we come to the interconnectors. Well, can we buy or sell? Can we buy more electricity in a hurry? From France and the Netherlands and Ireland and um, Norway and places. So looking at all those existing technologies, really we have we have nothing there that we can use to fill in the gap by the elimination of gas. Uh, and that means the only answer really is either we have voluntary power cuts, in other words, we I don't know switch off the railways for. <clears throat> um, Six hours until the wind starts blowing again, or maybe six days, depending on the fickleness of the wind. Or we have involuntary power cuts when it's not a, not a planned switch off, it's just the, the power dies. And those are not things we want to do in a modern, high-tech, fifth richest country in the world type society. But they are the inevitable consequences of going for decarbonisation within five of the grid within five years so, so it would seem sitting here at the moment then that there's just no chance of this happening within five years let's look at what the other things that people talk about are and we'll see we'll see yeah. how far we can get with that and everybody talks about batteries now so fantastic we have batteries have you never heard of batteries batteries are wonderful 
And indeed, batteries have been around for 200 years. Yeah. But in terms of practical terms of doing things, they are about between 100 and 1,000 times less good than they need to be to be the answer to all our prayers. Yeah, we covered batteries quite extensively in the first episode, didn't we? And We did. You know, the, the, what does that last 15 seconds if it was power in the UK or something like that? This, this was the one that, power, that would power for 15 seconds and cost uh, £5 million pounds a second. For yeah. So if you wanted a day's backup for the, the grid, you'd need to spend, I think I worked it out, something nearly three times the 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 NHS budget for nearly three years just on batteries. Good grief. And you need five five thousand sites like this. And you've got to install them all in less than two thousand days. So you need to install two and a half sites like this every day from now till the end of uh, to, from now till for the next four, four and a half years. Yeah, but it gets worse than that because batteries wear out. They do. So you'd be you'd be it'd be like painting the fourth road bridge. You'd never be finished. <laughs> exactly. So forget about that. That's that's not a practical proposition. Even if you could get the five hundred billion pounds, out, imagine yeah. this would cost. The, the government say they can't afford to give the pensioners one billion pounds a year. Yeah. This would five hundred years worth of that that the government and, can't afford. Right, and then you know, he's obviously got to be thinking there's going to be a breakthrough in battery or some similar storage technology that's maybe that's going to is. come along. Well, maybe there is, but this thing we see here was the biggest battery yeah. in Europe when it was installed, and it's installed less than two years ago. Yeah, yeah. I mean, current technology, batteries are a non-starter. Yeah, I think we can agree on that. Right. So let's look at some of the other things that people talk about, um, and that's I call them pipe dreams. Hydrogen. Uh, hydrogen is not an answer to anybody's dreams. It's just a way of wasting energy, actually. To make you, the problem with hydrogen is you have to make it. Yeah, you have to make it to burn it. So it's a closed loop system, and you lose energy all the way through that system. Apart from the fact that hydrogen is a very um, difficult, uh, difficult gas to work with. It's very tiny, small. It's explosive. You have to do it at all at high pressures. That means big, thick walls and heavy, heavy duty mm-hmm. um, containers to keep it in. So everywhere you go, you, you might think you've got a heavy battery car. Now, if you put hydrogen in it, you make it heavier and heavier. We have, I think, a couple of hydrogen powered buses in London, and you can just look at them. And you can see they're very low on the ground and very, very heavy. Well, that's heavier they are, the more difficult they are to move around. And so you get all sorts of difficulties with hydrogen. And though it was, you know, the the, uh, source of choice two or three years ago, people kept talking about it. I think I saw last week that the first commercial idea of making hydrogen was in one of the Scandinavian countries. And they basically said, well, we're shutting down because we haven't got any customers. Nobody wants to buy this stuff. So that that's out there. Yeah. <clears throat> Tidal and wave power is what everybody talks about, but nobody has ever successfully got it to work by well, one or two tidal systems in the world. It, it's fairly, you know, you can look at it and you can say, we should be able to do this, but people have been trying for going back as, a thousand years. As an ex-sailor, which you are as well, uh, Latimer, I think we could both agree that the sea is a harsh mistress. Well, the sea, yeah, I'm, I'm sure you're a better sailor than me. I mean, I'm just, I'm just uh, day sailing, really. But um, yeah, oh, the number of places that actually is the where the geography is right to make it work is very, very small. Yeah. Then geothermal. Well, that's nice. The idea is you you drill down twenty thousand feet where the rocks are hotter. You put water down there, and it comes back up as steam. Well, yeah. maybe. Yeah. Could be done, I guess. But if we haven't done it in the previous thousand years of our existence on these islands i doubt very much we're going to get it all done in under five years well yeah and then you're going to have all the people up in arms because it's no doubt going to cause minor fissures and tiny quakes like fracking would so 
Oh, absolutely. If you didn't, if you didn't like fracking, you're sure you're not going to not like geothermal. <laughs> yeah. Go ask Iceland how theirs works out at the moment. Yeah, it's great. It's great in Iceland. And hydro is great in Norway and yeah. um, and in Portugal, I think. And and if you've got the right geography, some of these things are great. But yeah. we'll, ju- just saying it works in Norway doesn't help. We are not in Norway. <laughs> like the, like um, you know, Dorothy in the Wizard of Oz. We're not in Kansas anymore. Well, yeah. No. And there's always um, thermonuclear fusion, the idea that uh, fusion reactions are going to give us unlimited um, electricity at no cost. Well, maybe that's going to come, but it's been 30 years ago for the last 30 years ahead for the last 50 years. Yeah, it's, it's a long time coming. I don't think I don't think we're any closer than we've ever been. To be well, fair, we might be getting there, and maybe in a hundred years it might happen. But it's still thirty years away, and it's not going to meet that five year deadline. What, what about see the fuel cells they use on like the ISS and spacecraft mm-hmm. and things like that? Mm-hmm. How do they work? What are they not? Is there anything in that technology that would be useful? I think that's just a variant on hydrogen, isn't it? They just separate the hydrogen and the oxygen. Oh, do they? Right. And recombine them to make water. Well, okay. yeah, that works, but at a scale where it's sensible to do it because you want to take something into space, so the yeah. cost really matter. Yeah. But it's not sensible to do it something where you put all you put on a hundred units of energy into separating hydrogen and oxygen. Yeah. And when you recombine them, you get sixty units back. Yeah, it doesn't really make much sense, does it? Well, you might as well have whatever you use to separate it. You might as well have used them in the first place and got all hundred of them out. So yeah, yeah it doesn't make any sense. And so the last chart I prepared, John, just says how long have we got to go? And as according to my calendar, we have as of today one thousand nine hundred and thirty-two days to complete Mr. Bit Miliband's grand project. And I think it ain't gonna happen. I yeah. don't know much if we'll get anywhere near it in that time. Do you think um do you think that people are starting to think and maybe this isn't such a great idea? Um, you know, generally in the whole world, not just in the UK. Oh, in the whole world, absolutely, yeah. In the whole world, this whole idea is of getting no, is getting less and less traction um, as politicians or sensible politicians realise that making people poor and cold is not likely to do them any good. Um, in the UK, so why, why, why is the UK and and it seems to be increasingly the US as well is actually starting to get on board with us. Well, why, why the two big, you know, f- f- what, historical powers so keen on making themselves bankrupt, um, e- e- energy-wise, you know? I don't know about the US. I'm not sure about, about them. I think they're kind of ambivalent. They make lots of noises, but when, I think we saw last week, week before, that uh, they weren't really doing an awful lot in cutting emissions and so forth. No, they're, they're not. And partly that's because they're an energy exporter. They they like to yeah. export their oil and coal and gas. So yeah, that, that's one of their big businesses. Uh, we're not. We could have been, and, and perhaps we were in the past. But we're choosing to um, to be very pure, pure in heart, pure in in virtue, and and poor, poor in in energy as well. Uh, there's a great line from. One of the union leaders today says, you know, we're exporting all this stuff. We're exporting jobs and importing virtue. And I thought he put that very well. Yeah. So I think the the net of all this is that this project will fail. It will fail publicly. And I suspect Mr. Miliband won't last very won't last very long in his job. And there will be a sort of uh general rearrangement of the jet chairs where you know, people are getting edging away from it from all this net zero stuff they're not going to have the scene conversions and say oh so this was all a big mistake yeah but it's gently deprioritized i i can see that right but while this is happening this is still going to hurt the people of britain so how long are we going to have to suffer under this until they recognise that it is failing and they, they you know, change think, to a different tack? I think it's going to have to be when one of the big parties 
starts to use this as a stick to beat beat the others with. Now, at the moment, the only party even making noises towards that is Reform, the N- Nigel Farage's party. Yeah. Um, but there is, of course, one party that is in some turmoil itself. Uh-huh. Yeah. Having been soundly defeated, <coughs> that's the Conservative Party that probably wants to um, re- reinvent itself in some way. And if it really wanted to reinvent itself and make itself look different from the others, then this is one of the battlegrounds that they could start to seize. And the other thing that comes to mind from my point of view is it's not just domestic electricity that's in danger here. It's, you know, commercial electricity for, for businesses, for oh, yeah. manufacturers. So yeah. what would and happen to the economy? If- railways and hospitals and... yeah. And all those things. Oh, yeah, it's not. It's certainly not just. Oh, sorry, John, the light's gone out. Your your freezer stopped working. It's there's an awful lot more than that. It's it's the whole country reliance on electricity. Yeah. Don't forget, uh, in parallel with this, decar- so are, are none of the big companies having a go at the politicians to say, look, this isn't feasible unless you you give us a plan as to what you're going to do, but because we can't continue. I mean. For instance, say you say you say you're an electroplater or something like that. So you're using loads of ele- electricity to stick metal to metal in effect. Yeah. So uh, if if electricity prices keep going through the roof, these guys are going to go. Well, we can't stay in business, or we're going to have to move to China. Yeah. Well, that, 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 for example, I mean, one, one business I know a bit about is aluminium. Right. We used to, aluminium in the UK. We used to make it. Um, in Scotland, indeed. Mm-hmm. Well, that's long gone. And there's no yeah, it wasn't the factory down in the um, south side of Glasgow, the, oh, the Alcan factory. Yeah, well, it was Baco before that. There was one. In, there was a rolling mill in Falkirk, and I think they made it up at uh, Invergordon. And yeah, I and, and, and else. My dad used to work for Baco. That's how I know a bit about it. So. And uh, so I, I remember touring the Falkirk rolling mill when I was about six. It was very exciting. Oh, it would be. Yeah, maybe 10, but lots of big, big things going on, you know, and big electrical bus bars. But you need an awful lot of cheap electricity. And when the electricity price goes up, then you know, forget it. It's not going to happen. So there's there's an industry that's gone already. Yeah, yeah. But yes, you're so, absolutely right. That, that is the consequence. And um, I'm not going, feeling... I'm not feeling all warm and fuzzy about this, Latimer. I've got to tell you that I, I can't see this being good for anyone. How how do we how do we solve this? Well, you can see what you can see who it's good for. It's good for Ed and, <laughs> and Ed and Peter. That's how it is. Oh. But, but that's the whole point of the, this whole thing. Is there's no rationality to it. It's a it's a, almost a religious. Yeah. A religious ritual to say, you know, I'm worshipping the, the great god of net zero. Well, maybe. But I, I got a feeling it's a dying cult around the world and we'll we'll eventually get round to die in it. Yeah. I think I think certainly from from chatting to you over the last couple of episodes on this one, it would seem that it's not something I think that is achievable by twenty thirty. Given the current state of technology, we would need a massive breakthrough in some kind of storage technology to be able to achieve this. But if 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 you have that, if that massive breakthrough comes right, then yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we understand what the problems are. What we don't understand is what the solutions. Now, if somebody comes along with a solution to the big problems, yeah, then it all gets her off, and maybe it is a sensible thing to do. But the one. <laughs> The big word in that sentence is if. if yeah. you, know, you can't you cannot make a strategy or a policy based on the idea that we're going to invent a technology that nobody's ever heard of before and we're going to get it up and running in four years. Yeah, right. It's not going to happen. Yeah. Okay. Well, I uh, I think um I think you've said it all. In fact, I think you've said more than enough. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for this episode of you by now. Thank you for this episode of Cabin Chronicles episode three. And um what shall we be touching on the next time? 
Oh, I don't know. Let, let's see what the news holds over the next couple of next few days, and we'll think about that next week. We okay. Thank you very much. End of the road tonight. Unveil the truth, not out of sight. Net zero plans, they clash and fight. Agenda dreams in dimming light. Energy falls like grains of sand. Policies drawn by an unseen hand. Crying out in this troubled land, questioning where we stand. The power fades, the questions grow In the shadows, truths will show Voices strong, they overflow A future built on what we know What tomorrow holds is our 